Good evening, and welcome to the Crossroads Hospice and Palliative Care Education Series. Tonight's topic is chronic pain management. Our presenter for this evening is Dr. Valerie Smith. Dr. Smith is the Medical Director of Crossroads Hospice Program. She is board certified by the American Board of Family Medicine and the Hospice Medical Director Certification Board. She has also completed a fellowship and is board eligible in geriatric medicine. She has been the Crossroads Hospice and Palliative Care Medical Director for almost five years. Tonight's program is meant to be interactive. So if you have any questions as Dr. Smith is speaking, please type in your question or questions in the comment box and she will answer them as they come in. Crossroads Hospice and Palliative Care would like to thank the Crossroads Hospice Charitable Foundation for their sponsorship of this program. At this time, I would like to present Dr. Valerie Smith. Thank you, Gwen. And welcome, as Gwen said, to um, a program on chronic pain management. Um, this is a program that initially what you're going to see on the screen when um, when when pulls it up the program it is for families and friends caring for older people at home that was um, originally created um, by healthandaging.org so this and many other products are available at healthandaging.org for caregivers um, that are taking care of their older, uh, people at home, and this is just one of them that I found that is applicable to more than just older people. I found things in here that I can use even on my younger patients. So I would like for you, though, to interact with me. Usually this is something before COVID-19 um, quarantining and staying in and social distancing. This is a program that I would present to larger groups and we would interact. So this is my first time of presenting this online. What I would like for you to do if you are out there, if you have questions or comments when I ask a question, if you would please just go ahead and text that and then just send it here so that we can still interact. Even though we're separate, I think that we just need to find ways that we can continue to interact. So getting onto our topic of chronic pain management. Um, with this one, it's a program for families and friends caring for older people at home. And we're gonna go to the, to the next screen as Gwen has just done. And when somebody has pain, there's usually a real problem behind pain. Most people don't just say, oh, I, I'm having pain just for the sake of saying it for attention there usually is a real problem behind pain. And this is just one of those things that I usually like to throw out there. Um, if, you, if you can think of something, what would, be, what would be something that you could text to us as a real problem behind pain? What is, what's causing the pain? So this is just something I want you to think about. Next slide. So these are some of the common causes of pain um, in people that are over 65 years old, but they're also common problems of pain in people that are younger than 65. It didn't just start at age 65. So arthritis, how many people out there can relate to arthritis and you're not over 65? I'm one of them. I can relate to that. I would say most people that are over 40 have tinges of it if it's an osteoarthritis. If it's a rheumatoid arthritis, you may have it even earlier than that. So this is one of those real problems that people have. Um, nerve damage. Anybody out there have nerve damage and what was that from? You can text any of these answers in. I have somebody here that can read those off if you happen to do that. Nerve damage can come from having diabetes. And many times that nerve damage can be felt in our extremities, our feet, and it can make it to where we're not feeling our feet and we could have ulcers. Nerve damage can happen from accidents to where our spinal cords have been damaged. Nerve damage in our necks just from everyday use, pinched nerves, 
So nerve damage is actually really common. Shingles, if you've ever had shingles, you don't ever want to have it again, but that can end up with something that's called um, the uh, neuralgia afterwards. So shingles itself can cause a long standing chronic pain issue. Circulation problems. Sometimes we have issues with our blood vessels that don't allow enough circulation to our extremities. And this can cause chronic pain in our legs. It can have claudication from circulation problems. Claudication is when the vessels, our arteries to our extremities, and usually it's our lower extremities, they have um, blockages or are they just getting smaller in diameter because of some uh, buildup. And when we walk, less blood can circulate to those extremities and the muscles aren't getting the oxygen that's in the blood. And so then as they are starving for that oxygen, then they start cramping and that's claudication. So that's from circulation problems. Certain bowel diseases can cause chronic pain. If you've ever heard of irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, um, and again, if any of you out there have any um, diagnoses or different things that, of understanding these problems that you'd like to just text, you go right ahead. I have a cohort back here that is monitoring the page and she will uh, give us your input too. So different bowel diseases can uh, be a problem for chronic pain. Cancers obviously uh, can be a cause of pain. And that's not just for people over 65. I'm a hospice physician and I manage cancer pain on a daily basis. So this is something that is very real. Fibromyalgia is one of those kind of, in many ways, it's been kind of a mystical type of diagnosis. And it's been like the diagnosis of exclusion, but it is very real. And those people that suffer from that will tell you that. Do we have a question? Phantom pain? Uh, so phantom pain definitely is a true pain. Your, your brain still feels that there is an extremity there. And definitely that would be a type of chronic pain would be phantom pain. Excellent, excellent point. Um, fibromyalgia, we just talked about trauma. Uh, trauma, obviously, that you've had in the past on different joints or extremities um, on your head, those can cause chronic pains. Even think about chronic headaches from trauma. Absolutely. And then uh, I think that um, health and aging really liked nerve damage because it's on here twice. Next slide, please. So understanding the problem, pain can lead to other problems. Let's think about that. If I have pain, and my pain started at age 40 when I had mild bunions, um, and let's just say that they just kept getting worse. And as my toes started bending over more and my bunion was just more inflamed, let's just say I started stepping differently and walking differently just so that I wouldn't have the pressure where that pain was. What can that lead to? That actually can start leading to problems in my knees. And then if I'm walking differently, then it problems in my hips. So pain in one area can actually start leading to other problems. This is with this one, it's just that pain in my bunions led to knee pain, hip pain. But let's talk about what other things pain um, can lead to other problems. If does anybody have any input on that? If you have any input. So if you're dealing with pain on a, on a continual basis and you're not able to concentrate on your daily activities, that could make people sad and depressed. So chronic pain can lead to depression. What else can chronic pain lead to? That can lead to um, eating disorders, anorexia, anxiety, Poor sleep. If you have back pain and you're trying to roll over at night, you automatically roll over. Your body wants to. And if you have pain, then it wakes you up at night and you can't sleep. So then you become sleep deprived. And then that depression. depression. Very good. I'm probably too fast for that. I could away from it. Definitely can lead to depression. 
So what else can happen if I'm having pain and let's say my bunions again, I say that because I have bunions. Um, let's just say, and I have, I've, and I've done this other thing too. You can actually have falls. If it was steppages off and you're having pain, it can lead to falls, uh, poor concentration. So lack of sleep, absolutely. Loss of identity, loss of self. These are good texts. Thanks for interacting. Loss of identity, um, just become reclusive. So chronic pain can lead to other problems. Most pain, though, improves with treatment. That is the good, the good news. Most pain improves with treatment. What kind of treatment, though, is what we're going to be talking about. So there is some good news with this. Um, I'm not going to say from my standpoint that we're ever going to get to having no pain, but if you've had chronic pain and it's been disabling, um, any relief improves your quality of life. And that's what we're talking about. Next slide, please. Creating injuries at other sites. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we want to start off with what do we want to do to treat our pain? And as a physician, some of the first things I'm usually asked is what kind of a medication will I prescribe? And then I have to back off and say, you know what? That's not normally the best strategy to start off for my pain. And I'm going to give you an example is my husband. I don't think he's watching. Um, is that you may interrupt me. Pain can lead to abuse of medications. Yes, it can. Pain can lead to abuse of medications. So we're going to talk about non-medication strategies first for pain relief. And again, I was, I was saying that I'm going to use my husband as an example. Um, he would watch television in a certain position for, you know, every night. And he would have his remote control and he would have his remote control and he'd be sitting on his side like this. And then you know, that was on for a long time. Then eventually he started telling me, you know what? I've got hip pain right over here, and I don't know what's causing that. And, um, and I would watch him after a while, and it's just like I wasn't going to give him anything for that, obviously, but I wanted to give him some advice. And so uh, what I did was I said, well, you know what, hon? I said, probably, why don't you just switch over to the other hip and sit like that every other day? And amazingly, that helps. So non-medication strategies for pain relief. And we're going to talk about relaxation. Um, what types of relaxation do you do to help to help de-stress and maybe take some of the pain off of you? I know for me, when I have pain in my bunions, I'll use those again. Um, it's kind of strange, but I like socks that actually give me a little bit of compression and that are fuzzy. Yes. That was a mouthful there. So I heard massage, guided meditation. guided meditation. That'd be kind of like biofeedback. Distraction, quiet. Just quiet music. Quiet music. Dark. The dark. Nothing that's overstimulating. Okay. Those are all ways to kind of relax too. I use music, but also for relaxation. Sometimes you might use a, um, a, a warm bath, a bubble bath, kind of relax with that. Even um, like we said, we talked about the massage or going to a spa, if you could do that, but something that's relaxing to help with the pain. Exercise, even though it sounds painful, in the long run, there are certain disease processes where exercise will help chronic pain. Fibromyalgia is one of the diseases that exercise is the number one, uh, I'm not going to say remedy, but treatment for pain is exercising if you have fibromyalgia. Um, exercise can help other kinds of pain. Let's talk about chronic back pain. So some of the back pain that we're having is because our core muscles get weak. Um, and you know, I'm guilty of that one too. So strengthening your core, your core muscles actually can help with better posture of your lower back to help with that back pain. So look for, look for exercise to help. Another input? Heat, heat or ice. Excellent, excellent input. 
So somebody has said use heat or ice. So there's two different kinds of pain that you can use heat and ice for. Ice is normally used for the types of pain that are acute, acute meaning they just started. Let's say you strained your neck or you um, have a strained ankle or a knee and you're feeling some immediate pain. That's usually when you want to apply ice or they're cool packs for that. Heat tends to help with chronic pain. And that makes kind of sense, doesn't it? That's usually used to water bottles and the heating pads. So chronic pain tends to respond more to heat, whereas acute pain from just a, a new injury or a sprain, that's where the ice tends to help the best. You, you might have one of, you might have a certain kind of pain that you've had for a long time that actually feels better with, with ice. Then I say, if it makes you feel better, then you do that. Any other comments? So going on down to physical therapy, physical therapy is to me, is almost like guided exercise where you have somebody that is um, in control to tell you exactly what to do for that certain part of your body that is having pain, whether you're going to strengthen it or um, you're needing to try something new so that you're not putting more pressure on other areas upstream from the pain. Physical therapy is something that you should always request from your primary care provider. It's not something that you can just go in and just say, hey, you know, I want to have physical therapy. If you have insurance and you want them to cover it, there are certain steps to go through. But physical therapy is something you can get some good advice from, get started, and then many of those things you could continue on home uh, by yourself. So a TENS unit, the transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. Wow. Okay, so if you've ever used a TENS unit, it's like having little, uh, the, the little sticky pads on you, and then you have like the little electrodes, and then they can turn it up to have like a little bit of a um, electrical current that could cause the muscles to contract. You can buy these on Amazon, probably can buy them at the drugstore. You got to be very careful with them because you really don't want to put them on your neck. You don't want to put them necessarily in your head. So again, these can be purchased, but I'm not going to recommend that you go out and do that unless you have some, maybe some input of a physical therapist. Many times you have physical therapy um, companies that have TENS units to get started on. And then biofeedback. Biofeedback is just the, the, the and I think somebody already had mentioned that. What did they call that, Val? It was... It was one of the comments that was a type of biofeedback. But we can just Google biofeedback. Next, <laughs> next slide, please. So medications that were used for pain relief. Um, some of the medications that are available over the counter. Yes, question. What is your take on ultrasound for pain? My take on ultrasound for pain. Um, I'm not going to say I have a take on that. So that's going to probably something that is going to be ordered by the, the physical therapist might do that and recommend it. And there's probably certain things that do work with the ultrasound for pain. I don't personally have a take on, on that, but if uh, a physical therapist or a pain management physician said to do it, then if you're having pain that hasn't responded to other things, then go for it. Acetaminophen, Tylenol. These are medications used for pain relief. When, we're, when we have to resort to a medication, we should always start with um, the, the pain medication that has the fewest side effects if possible. Always, always remember, any medication has a side effect. Tylenol has side effects. Aspirin has side effects. So anything that we put in our mouths and many things that are topical that can soak in and absorb, they can have side effects. So that being said, we're going to go back to the Tylenol. Tylenol is one of the medications that as we get older in our older generation, that's re recommended over other NSAIDs and opioids to start with. There are less um, contraindications with acetaminophen, which is Tylenol. Now it's not an NSAID, so it does not decrease inflammation. It just treats pain and it can treat um, fevers. Now, one medication that we used to have years ago, and it was the only pain medication that we had, and would somebody please just text that to the Facebook page? Because I want to hear somebody else say, what was the medication that we all had growing up? If you're 
over 50. And I'm not even going to mention it right now because it was the only thing we had on our shelves. We didn't have Tylenol back then. We did not have Aleve. We didn't have ibuprofen. I'm not going to mention it. Somebody's going to mention it here in a little bit. Aspirin. Aspirin. That's right. If you think about what we had in our, in our medicine cabinets, we had aspirin. We had children's aspirin. And you know, I don't think we even had um, children caps back then either. So one of the other medications that's listed on here is opioids, narcotics. Examples of those are hydrocodone, oxycodone, morphine. And if you've ever heard of tramadol, a lot of people say that's just kind of like opioid light. It is still considered an opioid, still is a controlled substance. So I would put tramadol in there too. Next page. Other medications used, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. This is the NSAIDs. And this is where we have examples of aspirin. Again, we used to have aspirin all the time. That's what we took. We would take two aspirins. And it's, you know, even you know, as a kids, we would take aspirin. I don't know why we stopped it all together. I guess we had all these other ones. But for some people, I still have a few patients that are older that just prefer taking aspirin for their pain relief, as long as their stomachs can handle it. They're usually taking it anyway for prophylaxis. Um, ibuprofen, which is Advil, and naproxen. These are all non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and these can help with inflammation. These also can help with fever. Um, for me, I actually feel that the NSAIDs work better for my pain than Tylenol does. Maybe that's because I have more inflammation going on. So everybody's going to be different, but non-steroidals have more side effects as we get older than Tylenol. Non-steroidals can lead to, uh, to gastrointestinal bleeding. You have to be careful if we're taking steroids with that. If we're going to be over age 65 and we're taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, we need to be taking something to help protect our stomach lining too. Something like Prilosec, Nexium, or an H2 blocker, or Pepsid, if you can get these anymore. So many of them have been taken off the market now. I think we have a hard time getting Pepsid and Ranitidine because they've been taken off the market or they're back ordered. So you may end up taking a PPI, which is like Nexium or Prilosec. Uh, this is what I like, the next one, creams and patches. Creams and patches. Uh, capsaicin, anybody know what capsa capsaicin is made from? I'll, I'm gonna let you text that one in. Um, methyl salicylate, it's like Bengay. So if you think about, you know, topical Bengay actually um, is very beneficial. Um, or just plain menthol. These are creams and patches, and I really recommend these for use before we start going into using a lot of the oral types of medications. So capsaicin is one of those that's used for the herpatic neuralgia after shingles or during shingles, and there is a um, recommendation to use that as a topical. We haven't, I haven't heard anybody yet, so no one out there must know it's that capsaicin is made from peppers. So it's made from peppers. So again, um, you can buy these over the counter, the methyl salicylate, the generic Bengay, or some menthol. And I believe that these are medications to start with before you go into taking the oral medications if you don't have too sensitive of skin. Going on to the next page, we have um, a, kind of like a declaration. Every person has the right to good pain control. And... <laughs> In healthcare now, we've had issues with opioid addiction. And so there's always, there's been that stigma now that when we're going in someplace because we're having pain that we feel like, and I, and you know, we feel like that we're being judged. Are you just here to get opioids? And so I still want to say with this, with this, that every person does have a right to good pain control. Um, it's not necessarily easy, but uh, is something that we need to strive for. Next slide. So your goals are to help evaluate and relieve pain. That's what our goals are. We want to help evaluate it, and then we want to relieve pain. And you want to keep the healthcare provider informed about pain levels and responses to pain treatment. Your healthcare provider is not going to know unless you keep records of how things are, how things are going for you. Arnica. Arnica, and that's something to you. Is it something you take in orally or is it? It's a, for pain? For Shelly. 
All right, Shelly. So um, what is, is that something you take orally or is it something that you put on top? And that, how do you spell that? A -R. A -R. Arnika. Interesting. I have not heard of that. So maybe she can respond and let us know how that's taken and what the, is it a plant and what's derived from? Or was that the, or was that the answer to the capsaicin? I didn't know if that was a special she kind of, that. I didn't know if that was a special kind of pepper or something. She answered that after <laughs> well, I'd like to know, I would need to look and see, is it a chili pepper? Is it a hot pepper? Which kind of pepper is it? That's what, it's just a capsaicin pepper. Okay. So again, these are, our goals are to help evaluate and relieve pain and to keep the healthcare provider up to date with what's going on. Next slide. So when to get professional help, when to call the healthcare provider immediately or go to the emergency room. So not all pain is what I call benign, meaning that, um, that it is something you can just wait on. There are some pains that are emergencies. And I've noticed as I've gotten older, there are pains I'm like, whoa, where'd that one come from? That's a new pain. I've never had that before. Is this something I need to be worried about? So yes, there are times when you need to think a little bit more into the pain that you're having and then you're like, okay, is it time for me to go to the doctor? Do I call him? Do I need to call 911? Do I need to say, hey, let's go. Let's take me to the emergency room to be checked out. Next slide. So call the healthcare provider immediately if there is a change in the ability to walk or carry out other important activities because of pain. So this is a sudden change. Sudden change is an activity. They often mean that you're having a significant pain crisis and that there's something going on that is acute, meaning that you might need to have it looked at. So this, I like this slide here, is that the sun pain has stopped this person's dead in their tracks right there. Okay, there's something wrong here. So that this is the time to immediately get some help. Next slide. New pain that is severe. So if, what, what kind of pains would be new pains? I'm looking at this slide here of this gentleman sitting in the chair and he, his face, he's grimacing. And he's probably shaking. What kind of pain is he having? It's pretty severe because he's not wanting to move. I'm thinking maybe he's got something going on inside here, uh, but it's, it's just, it's just stopped him dead in his tracks and he's sitting down there. So any new pain that is severe, you need to immediately get help. Next slide. So you're going to call the healthcare provider immediately if there is a new pain that is not, not severe, but is causing the person significant distress. Call the healthcare provider immediately if there's a new pain that is not severe, but is causing a person significant distress. Talk about not wanting to live anymore. That's another reason to call. Because sometimes if somebody's having chronic pain and they're depressed, they might start talking about really not wanting to live anymore. So another comment? Your last question, that, that guy looked like he was having abdominal pain. Exactly. And he needed some help. And in those, and what's if it, I'm not going to say this is funny, but a lot of times those severe pains actually are severe constipation in an elderly person. And we will talk about certain things that are contributing to that here in a little bit further into our program. So new pain that is not severe, but is causing distress. Let's just say that person looks like he's having indigestion. So that might be a time to call your healthcare provider and see what they want you to do. Next slide. Uh, when to call the healthcare provider during office hours. Next slide. Uh, when you're not getting relief after taking pain medication as recommended. Let's just say that my bunion, uh, me and my bunion, my bunion's been hurting. I'll go to my healthcare provider and my healthcare provider says, well, I want you to take the ibuprofen 200 milligrams tab. I want you to take two of them three times a day for five days. And then um, we'll, we'll just check back after that for two weeks. And so this gentleman here, he's, he's having an issue. He's having his pain. He's taking the medication and he's got the pain right afterwards. Well, sometimes you got to have to give a little bit of time, but you might want to contact after five days. If it's still not where you want it to be, then that's when you need to call your healthcare provider. Next slide. Uh, some pain relief, but there is still a lot of pain one or two days after starting the medication. That's when you want to call the healthcare provider during office hours. If there is some pain relief, but there's still a lot of pain one or two days after starting the medication. Okay. Next slide. 
call the healthcare provider during office hours if there is a new or different pain, new or different pain. I think that I would probably, if that was me um, in the way that I looked in that second one, I would be calling probably after hours or going to the ER if I looked like that. So if you have new or different pain, you need to be calling your healthcare provider. Next slide, please. Um, call the healthcare provider during office hours if there are side effects of pain medication. All right, here we're looking at this one. Um, nausea. What pain medications cause nausea? And text that answer in. What pain medications cause nausea or someone to be more tired? Oh, and look, there's the big word constipation. That's what is a side effect of opioids is constipation. And many times as acute abdominal uh, pains uh, can be contributed to constipation. So making sure that if we're gonna take certain kinds of pain medication like opioids, we always need to be taking something to make sure that our stools are gonna continue to move. Um, what an opioid does is it goes to certain receptors that are in our gut and it blocks those receptors and it keeps what's called peristalsis from moving things along. It just slows things down. Um, Imodium actually does that too. It kind of goes to those same receptors and slows it down when people have diarrhea. So we don't want to, to have constipation. So we're not going to take Imodium. We're going to take things like um, Senna S, Senna, Colace, Miralax, Milk of Mag, certain things that you're going to take to soften your stools and keep things moving. Most medications cause nausea. Um, I, you know what? She's right. Because if you, anything that you put in your tummy can cause it. Ibuprofen definitely can cause nausea. Um, I haven't taken a whole lot of other pain medications except for that and Tylenol. And I definitely have a lot of patients where the opioids cause nausea. But definitely um, anything that you put in your belly has a potential of doing that. Thank you, Shelly. So again, we've talked about constipation. So anything that causes nausea or tiredness, you want to bring to your healthcare provider's attention because you don't want to get into this cycle, which if you look at your drug list, find out how many of your medications that you're taking are actually being taken to treat the side effects of another medication that you're taking. This is kind of that slip slippery slope. So we take, a not, we take a pain medication, then we're nausea, then we end up taking another medication to treat that nausea. Well, even that medication you just took for that nausea can have side effects, and then that can cause problems. Uh, a good portion of the ER visits from um, our elderly population are side effects from medications. So we need to be very careful about medications we start and just not starting the slippery slope of having to take medication on top of medication just to treat what we were treating the first time. Next slide. Call the healthcare provider during office hours if there are changes in your sleep. Uh, this is when you've had medication. So what kind of medications can cause changes in our sleep? I'm gonna just wait a, wait a second or so and see if anybody can text that. What kind of medications, pain medications that we take um, might cause changes in our sleep? And sometimes if you take too many of these, they might cause you to go to sleep for a long time. I'm going to talk about opioids. Oh, that, somebody's probably texting that pretty soon, but opioids can actually cause uh, changes in your sleep. They can actually cause you sleep too long. Um, again, you, people can overdose with opioids, but if they're prescribed and taken appropriately, then they are excellent pain medications when they are needed. Not everybody needs to be on an opioid. There are a lot of other things that we can take, but sometimes they are beneficial and they are needed and we should have them available. They are correct. Eduardo and Shelly, thank you. And so changes in sleep can be from, uh, from the medications. Can some medications keep you awake? Absolutely. There are some people have a paradoxical effect to the opioids and it keeps them wide awake. So sometimes we have to um, alter when we give medications. So that would be something to talk to your healthcare provider about. Next slide. 
Call the healthcare provider during office hours if there's trouble coping with pain. Absolutely. Trouble coping with pain. What are some of those things? We already talked about having depression. Um, we've talked about, you know, possibly if somebody's just saying, you know, I cannot deal with this pain any longer. I don't even want to live if I have to have this type of pain. Uh, this is something that you definitely need to be talking to your healthcare provider and maybe getting into a pain management specialist at that point. Next slide. So know the answers to the following questions before you call your healthcare provider. Uh, can you describe the pain? And this is what I'll ask my nurses many times when they're out seeing patients and they're calling me uh, about, you know, so-and-so has increased pain. And then I'll be asking them, okay, can you tell me more about this pain? Where is it located? How does it feel? Is it, is it stabbing? Is it throbbing? Is it burning? Because different kinds of pains uh, usually are telling me something about what medication or what therapy might be the best. How long has the pain been a problem? Is this a new pain? Is this something that's just been building up over time? So those, it tells me something too. Okay, what was associated with that? You had this new pain. Well, what did you do? Well, you know, I kind of tripped last night and I fell against my arm. Well, then I need to know those types of things. And so your healthcare provider would need to know that too. Is it a new pain or has it happened before? Um, so sometimes my nurses will tell me about a pain and then I'll just say, hey, can you ask so-and-so, uh, have they ever had this pain before? Oh yeah, I had this 20 years ago and this is what it was then and this is what they this is what they had to do for it. Or, you know, this happens every six months whenever this happens. So knowing the history of it, is it a new pain or has it happened before? Where is it located? Is it in more than one area? So sometimes if you have very precise pain that's in the middle of my back right here, that's different than a pain that starts there and moves around. So where is it located? Is it in more than one area? And how severe is the pain? Sometimes you will have a nurse will say on the scale from one to 10, 10 being the worst pain that you've ever had and zero being no pain. Where are you in this? And this is very subjective to the person who's doing this scale. I will have some people that will say, my pain is a 10, but yet they could still be playing on their phone and talking to everybody. And then I'll have other people that will say it's a seven. And you can tell by looking at their face that they aren't comfortable. They can barely even speak. So it's very subjective on the person and how we feel about pain. Next slide, please. What does the pain feel like? Is there any numbness, tingling, or new weakness in the pain area? Very important items there. How does the pain change? How does it change over time? When you change position, does it go away? Let's just say I have lower back pain when I'm walking, but when I sit, it goes away. That is very distinctive for certain types of back disorders. Or does it get worse with ambulation? So again, knowing all of these different nuances about your pain is going to help your physician to know what is the best therapy for you. How is the pain affecting your ability to do what you want? How is it affecting your quality of life? That's very important for us because if it's affecting our quality of life to where we're not enjoying life, then that's just a spiral that we don't want to go to. So we need to know how is it affecting our lives? Are we able to enjoy things? And that's what we want to be able to do. Next slide. Okay, this is what makes the pain better. Well, when I sit down, my pain gets better. When I'm not walking on my feet, my bunions don't hurt. When I elevate my legs. So what makes the pain better? What medicines are being taken? That's so important for me to know what you've taken for the pain and what has worked. Did it stop? Did it work for a while and it stopped working? That will help me. So what medications are being taken? And then if you're taking those medications and you're still having the pain, that tells me, hmm, maybe that's not the best pain medication for the type of pain that you have or what's causing your pain. And we need to try something else. Are the, medica are the medicines taken at set times or just when needed? Some, we have some patients that will just take medications when they're having pain. I have some stoic patients though that don't, that don't, that 
feel like they are weak if they take a pain medication and then their pain gets out of control. And I'm just like, mm, let's don't wait that long. Sometimes you just need to have, I would call it a steady state of a certain medication in your system so that you're not having the spikes up and down because those up and downs are not going to contribute to a better quality of life. If you take a certain amount of medication, you can keep your pain level here, then you're still gonna be having a pretty decent quality of life without having pain interrupting everything. So again, are you taking the medications at set times or just when needed? Um, how do you tell when they are needed? What do you determine as a need for taking a medication? It's, and it's dependent on the person. Everyone is different. Is the person you're caring for allergic or sensitive to any pain medications? That's something that you need to know before you call the physician. When I have a patient on hospice and they're needing an opioid to help with their pain from cancer, um, I need to know what happened when they took hydrocodone or took morphine. Did it cause a rash? Um, did it cause nausea? There are different, there, there are allergies and then there are sensitivities and adverse reactions. Allergies are an allergic reaction, a true allergic reaction is you know, you're gonna have you know, scratchy throat usually, you might have that anaphylaxic type of thing, whereas the majority of these medications are gonna have side effects that people just aren't gonna like. Nausea, dizziness, sleepiness. Some people can cause increased confusion. That's something that as we get older and we take medications such as opioids that can cause our increased confusion. And that's something that is not an allergy, it's a side effect that's very common. So I'm always going to say, start low and titrate slowly. As we get older, we should always start low dose and titrate slowly to try to prevent these adverse effects. Next slide. So what can you do to help? What can we do to help? Next slide. Listen for words other than pain. Sometimes somebody, especially if, we're have, if we have an element of dementia, we might not be able to come out right with the word pain. We might say, I feel a little sore. It's a little achy. I have some discomfort. It hurts. Somebody didn't say I have pain, but they're saying all those other words that possibly could mean that they're having pain. Next slide. Look for behavior body language that looks like a response to pain. Yeah, he definitely looks like he's having something going on in his abdomen, doesn't he? Then you're looking at like, is something going on, dad? And dad may not be able to tell you what's going on either because the pain is so intense or it doesn't feel like pain that dad can describe or dad may have some dementia and is not able to tell you what's going on. So looking for body language. Next slide. Use pain medications as recommended. Um, there's a reason for that because there's, uh, there's side effects to medications. And even Tylenol, if you take too much Tylenol, it can cause liver damage. So you need to take pain medications as recommended. When it comes to Tylenol, the bottle will say 4,000 milligrams. And I will usually say, drop that down to no more than 3,000 milligrams a day. Um, NSAIDs can have side effects. So you don't want to take more than the recommended daily amount. Um, otherwise, you could end up with some kidney damage or ulcers. Um, opioids are something that we should all know what happens if you don't take them the right way. Um, you could have an overdose from an opioid, which could lead to death. Um, but that is something that if you're following your directions, it should not happen. So again, use medications as recommended. So the next slide, don't withhold medication for fear of addiction. Again, don't withhold medication for fear of addiction. Um, unfortunately, there's an element that has used medications that were, that were designed to help us to not have pain. And they've, they have been used out on, on the, the we call it on the streets and people have become addicted. This is something that if we have true pain and we require opioids, we shouldn't be afraid to take them, uh, especially, you know, if we're older, last thing, if I have cancer, I'm not going to be worried about getting addicted to something. I want my pain managed. And so that's where I come from as a hospice physician is that, you know, I want people to not worry about being addicted. I want them to have a quality of life and I'm not going to prescribe more than they need to have to have their pain controlled. Next slide. 
um, insist on good pain control. And I know sometimes you feel like you're going to your physicians, the, the, your primary care providers, and they probably look at you like, you know, don't tell me what to do, but we need to insist that, uh, that our parents, that even ourselves, if we're having pain, that, that we need to find something and, you know, just reiterate, I'm going to say, just reiterate it to your primary care providers that I'm not here for opioids. I'm here for pain relief. So we're looking, you want to just let them know you want to look at every modality that we've talked about today. And they might want to do a referral to a pain clinic, which is fine because the people at the pain clinic are specialized in pain management and will probably get you to the physical therapist, will probably teach you about the topical treatments and other things. So insist on good pain control. Next slide. Ask about pain clinics. We just talked about that. Uh, pain clinics are specialized. Sometimes if um, our primary care providers and many right now are uh, kind of shying away from opioids and well, they say, if you need that point, then we probably need to get you into a pain clinic and let the pain medicine specialist take over at that point. Next slide. This is where the things I like, I use heat. So many times if you have chronic pain, as I was talking about before, and this is where one of the, um, the Facebook watchers now had mentioned earlier, heat and ice, use warm showers, baths, or hot water bottles or warm washcloths to, um, to help alleviate some of the chronic pain. And that one looks like she's having a hot bath there. It probably could be an all over muscle ache pain, back pain, um, hot water bottles. Do they still make hot water bottles? I don't know. I haven't seen a hot water bottle. I think they probably do. Uh, so one thing you have to be careful about are heating pads. Um, I have a heating pad at home. I use it sometimes when I have back pain. But when someone is older, they sometimes, they're not feeling the heat and they can get burned. So you need to be very careful with a, with a, um, a heating pad. Um, but hot water bottles are, I guess, probably still out there. And definitely warm washcloths. And they, use, they do have these little things you can put in the microwave that have, I think, it's like popcorn in it. And those can heat up and you use those around your neck. Those are pretty nice too. Next slide. So the use the cool cloths. This person looks like they're taking out some ice and they're putting it in probably a washcloth to put on an area. Again, we talked about acute pain. Acute pain is acute inflammation uh, where sometimes cold compresses will help. Make sure that you're not putting the ice itself on the skin. We don't wanna cause an ice burn on the skin. So again, you wanna put the ice within a, a cloth before you put it on the area. Next slide. Uh, position the person carefully, position the person carefully with pillows and soft, soft seat cushions. Um, sometimes, hey, I can show you what I'm using right here because I get a pain because I sit for so long sometimes doing this. I've got this special cushion that looks just like this. See, so that is a cushion. So that's something that, I can figure out how to put it back down again. All right, Jordan. So don't do heat with nerve pain. Oh, okay. Well, uh, you're talking about for like uh, nerve pain from maybe diabetes, peripheral neuropathy, nerve pain, or uh, from um, an accident or something. That that's if the physical th if therapist has said that, then if it doesn't work for you and it makes it worse, then you go with the cool pain. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, position the person carefully with pillows and soft seat cushions. I want to make sure that we're turning each, turning the patients side by side. We don't want to get pressure ulcers. Next slide. Encouraging relaxation to kind of help distract from pain. This person looks like they have, oh, look, headphones on. They've had a book there. They've been reading. They're listening to their favorite music. I think the only thing I would want different on that picture is to have my feet propped up. That way it would really help me relax. So encourage relaxation as a distraction. And the headphones, I think, are, are a, a good addition. That way those can be quiet and the televisions, you sometimes can get too loud. Relaxation. Provide pleasant activities. Looks like conversation. We have some people like puzzles, games. So provide pleasant activities. Take the mind off the pain. Next slide. Avoid stressful events when possible. You can just see the, t the muscles tensing up with that one. Next slide. 
carrying out your plan. All right, so we're gonna plan now. We're gonna go see our healthcare providers. Next slide. So possible problems carrying out our plans might be, quote, if I tell the healthcare provider about my mom's pain, he'll or she'll think she's a complainer. Um, quote, of course she has aches and pains. She's old, end of quotes. Well, you know, I can be guilty of like, yes, I have aches and pains, I'm old, but it doesn't mean I shouldn't address it. So even if we hear something like that, okay, I'm old, I have pain, what can we do so that my quality of life improves? And um, don't worry about if the healthcare provider thinks that she's a complainer, you're still gonna bring that attention to them. Next slide. My father is confused. What he says doesn't make sense. So I can't tell whether he's in pain or not. I'm afraid of addiction. So when my father is confused, what he says doesn't make sense. So I can't tell if he's in pain or not. What are you going to do? What do you think? When people are confused and we have many patients that have end-stage Alzheimer's disease, we have to be able to anticipate if they are having pain and know how to look. And so we'll do, we'll look at facial expressions to see if there's grimacing when somebody's moving. They don't have to say, I'm in pain. They're going to let you know, you're going to know they're in pain. Sometimes they, people act out when they are in pain. And we just have to try different med modalities to see if that was the case, a different kind of chair, a different kind of cushion to help them be more comfortable. And check their flack. Thank you, Jordan. Flack scale is is a we, we look at somebody and it's a scale that we use in medicine and many times with patients that have uh, Alzheimer's or cannot tell us what's going on. Um, what are they showing? And the flack scale is all of these nonverbal types of things that we can look at, and it's a scale that we can determine. Eduardo says, look at other signs of pain. Look at other signs of pain. What other signs of pains of facial expressions, right? That would be the other signs of pain. What else do we do with signs of pain? Won't move. Agitation. That's always a big one right now. People are getting agitated and we're trying to figure out. I've often, when I do this in person with people, I'll talk about, okay, how do you tell if uh, an infant is having pain? It's kind of hard. You have to go through the list of different things and it's kind of like an exclusion thing that, okay, well, maybe they're constipated or have gas, but you finally get to that point because they can't tell us. It's kind of the similar, the same way of doing a flack with that. I'm afraid of addiction. Wow. Don't, I'm just gonna say, don't be afraid of addiction. If we are older and we have chronic pain issues that need to be addressed and we have ruled out every other way of, of addressing that and it helps, then I'm not going to be afraid of addiction for myself if I had chronic pain with end-stage cancer. Um, that's, that's something I'm not even going to think about at that point. <gasps> Pins, hands Pins. like this. Tense hands is a sign of um, having pain. I'm doing this. Like, oh, do something. I don't know how to tell you, but I'm hurting. Very good. A younger person who's having pain that says they're afraid of addiction. Um, so this is why I used to tell my younger patients in clinic is that, you know, if we get you started on this now and, and before we rule out everything else and get used to doing all these other modalities is that look at how much of your life you have left to live. And if we are on this now, by the time you're 70 years old, that it's going to have, we're going to have a hard time meeting your needs when it comes to pain management. So you know, if a person actually, actually needs to have it and they're young, I would say we do it for a very short amount of time. But when somebody's young, we need to be looking at other modalities to treat their pain before throwing on an opioid because they are very addictive. And I mean, I've, I've been taking, I've taken care, I take care of hospice patients now that have a history of using lots of opioids. And sometimes their pain management is very difficult because it requires so much when I'm treating their pain from end-stage cancer. So I just say, let's, let's just save that medication for when we're older and let's just use these other modalities first. And when we're younger, we're more likely to do a surgery than we are when we're older. 
And so I would say when we're younger, that's when we're going to do the surgeries to help, to help correct the pain that we're having, the chronic pain. Those are good questions. Got some smart people out there watching. So uh, that's, that's a possible problem carrying out your plan is I'm afraid of addiction. Next slide is think of other problems that could interfere with carrying out your plan. Can anybody else out there think of any other problems that could interfere with us carrying out our plans for getting pain management for either whether it be our patients or our, our, our families? Um, we're not there. I mean, I can see that. I mean, I, we right now, what's going on? I'm not seeing my parents because I'm restricting myself from seeing them because I see COVID-19 patients. So that's interfering with possibly carrying out the plan for my mom's shoulder pain. So what do we do? Well, we're gonna have to FaceTime just like we're doing now, folks. Anybody else have any other suggestions on other problems that could interfere with carrying out our plans? That's a big one right now because people are afraid to go into the, the physician's offices. So we're having to do a lot more telemedicine. Next slide. Checking on your progress. So ask about pain regularly. Um, keep notes. Ask for. Shelly wants to go back to your slide. Other problems that may have been interfered. Family interference. <gasps> family interference. So going back to the slide about other things that interfere or family interference. Family interference as in, um, yeah not letting you have that pain management. That's a possibility. Sometimes families come in and say, well, you don't need that. You just need to do this. That is true. Good comment. How do you recommend dealing, How do you recommend dealing with families? As if, well. And then she has another question. So. Okay. How do we deal with families that interfere with pain? I'm not sure that I'm understanding the full question. Is that families interfering with the, like I say, if I was the daughter and I wanted to take my mom or dad to um, have their pain managed, and then there's another family member that comes in and has disagreements with that, at that point, if the family member is still able to make decisions for themselves, you have to talk to the family member and see what their wishes are at that point. Okay, we have another question. The myth that, still on the same topic, the myth that morphine means death is near. The myth that morphine means death is near. Morphine is an old opioid medication. And if we put it in the scope of all the opioids, opioids that we have now that I use in hospice even, um, it's one of the more mild ones because we have some that are so much stronger than morphine. Um, so I think that's just something that people have always heard that, you know, oh, the morphine is, is you know, the myth is that it's right before I'm going to die. No, morphine is actually, you know, it's, it's a good pain medication, but it's, it's right there next to hydrocodone. So if you've ever taken Norco, it's kind of like about on that level. We have some that are even stronger than that, more potent, dilaudid, hydromorphone, which is dilaudid, fentanyl, um, oxycodone. What I just said, if that family member says they don't want to give them morphine because they feel like that, and, and they rightly so, the patient, if they have a family member that was dying and they received morphine and they died, then they equate that it was the morphine that did that. So sometimes I'll just say, you know what, why don't we get hydrocodone instead? Because sometimes they're okay with that because their loved one has taken Norco, which is hydrocodone with Tylenol, and they do fine with it. So in their, in their minds, they're okay with it, even though five milligrams of hydrocodone equates to five milligrams of morphine. Um, in their minds, it's just easier on them. We can go with that. We work with it. All right. So we're going to um, ask about pain regularly. Keep notes. Next slide. Ask for a referral to pain clinic. Not all pain can be totally relieved, but people can be taught how to live better lives with their pain. And that's the point that I would like for you to take away with that is that, you know, we can still live and have pain. We need to work through the, the best that we can to have a quality of life. So not all pain can be totally relieved, but people can be taught how to live better lives with their pain. Um, my bunions don't hurt as much anymore. It could be because I don't wear fancy, you know, pointy shoes anymore. I wear comfortable shoes. So we, we, we learn to live with our pain. And, you know, I take some ibuprofen um, and I live with it and I have a good quality of life. 
um, I think we've been doing our questions along the way. I do want to say, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, for more information, um, www.healthandaging.org. This is a wonderful set of educational slides that are available through the American Geriatric Society, which I am a member, and this is part of the presentation kit. So I would like for you just to give them the kudos that this is wonderful product that they have. And again, this is with the healthandaging.org. Um, if you want to go to that website and look at other things that they might have to help you with taking care of your loved ones and uh, I know that in one month I'm going to be back and we're going to be talking about brain health. I might be able to find another topic from healthandaging.org with brain health. If not, I have plenty um, of other um, programs to present on Alzheimer's disease, dementia. So that's going to be next month that we're going to be presenting. Were there any other questions out there? No, nope, I think we're getting at the end of our program pretty soon. I'm going to give it one minute. We have a little bit of lag time. That's right. Are we good? But Gwen, are you still on? I am here. Do you have any questions or comments? Oh, we could talk for another hour, but I don't think everybody wants to hear me talk. But I do want to say a big thank you to Dr. Smith for this presentation this evening and all those who attended and had some amazing and wonderful questions and comments. We really appreciate you being here. Yes, and I thank all of the comments and the interactions. I appreciate that very much. You all be safe out there and take care. And wash your hands and social distance. And if you have face coverings, wear them when you're out. And remember that the face covering isn't to protect you, it's to protect everybody else out there. So wear your face coverings.